Come on in, guys. Take a seat with us. We get all situated here. You can go to Facebook. You can press share too. All right, let's get it. We are live, guys. Tonight we are in Columbus, Ohio. Birthplace of myself, so I'm excited. Go here. All right, we're looking good. It's a little loose set up here. Got a couple posters up. Uh, since the rents are not here anymore, it's nice to set up your house the way you want to set it up. All right, well, you ready? Hang on, oh, yeah. so you gotta set it. Get, you want, will we wait? Can you give me one second. I can do one second. All right, guys. I guess I'll get started here. My name is Bobby Levine. Alongside me is my new co-worker at Art City, down in the short north area of Columbus, Juan Vasquez. What welcome, up? Welcome to the podcast, bud. How we doing? Juan is from uh, New Jersey. Hell yeah. Dirty Jersey, Garden State of America. Garden State of America. I don't know how the dirty part goes with that, though. Uh, it's also known as the Armpit of America, but, you know. You guys got uh, PVR out of there? Do we really? I think so. I don't know. You guys got some weird beers. Anyways, <laughs> he's a huge NBA guy, NBA guru. He'll be my new NBA guy up in Columbus. Uh, big show tonight. We got the World Series going on. If you guys are watching that, we were watching that just before we went live here. It is a 1-1 game. We'll keep you updated and go along with the ride as well. Uh, we'll talk about the MLB first. Then we'll flip over to a little bit of college football this week coming up. Huge game here in Columbus with the Ohio State Buckeyes taking host to the number two ranked nationwide uh, Penn State Nitty Lions. This is what they call the rematch of last year, which almost affected Ohio State not getting to the Final Four. And Penn State lost to Michigan earlier last year and helped not, it affected them not getting in the Final Four as well. And then uh, in a showdown against USC to end the, end the bowl season there against the, in the Rose Bowl, excuse me. And then we finish up with a lot of NBA, and that's what you're on here for. So let's dive sure. in here first. Our sponsors, J&J Mobile Detailing down in Athens, Ohio, behind Avalanche Pizza. If you're down there, folks, get your car washed, waxed, rinsed, shined, all that good stuff. They have a shampoo your car for you. I thought you never was, ever would see that in your life again, but I promise you it does happen. So let's dive in now to the MLB. We have yeah. the now newly, I guess, as five years ago, American League team, the Houston Astros, are taking place with the best team in baseball all year long, the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Dodgers are in the World Series for the first time since 1988. Long yeah. time ago. Yes, what do you got on this? Well, how'd they get here first off? Um, well, I mean, it was a rough couple games, um, but let me just talk about one thing real quick. Yeah, yeah do you think? Do yeah, you yeah. Think. let me get in on something real quick. Um, as we just, as our co-host here, Bobby, just noted, um, it's been a while since the Dodgers have been in the World Series, and I think with Clayton Kershaw, um, how do you feel about his consistency? First time for ever in a World, World Series game. So here's a fun fact about Kershaw for all you guys back here watching. Clayton Kershaw makes $33 million a year. Okay, I mean, that more money than anyone here even could probably combine watching this podcast makes in a single year. Uh, if he throws 30 games all year long and throws 100 pitches in each game, he throws around 3,000 pitches for the entire year. You average that out, he's getting paid $11,000 per pitch. I mean, that's, that's amazing money if you think about it. That's pretty good. This guy <laughs> is, the, is the franchise face for the Los Angeles Dodgers and have been for a long time. Uh, he's... Choked in previous postseasons, but I have this season, uh, this season especially, he's pitched amazingly. He was hurt. He's been hurt earlier on in the year. He came back and has been absolutely on fire. Started out this game dealing like always. Uh, you expect him to go at least six, seven innings each game, if not farther, and getting at least 10 strikeouts. The guy's an animal. Uh, he definitely puts the team on his back, and I do believe that the Dodgers have a realistically amazing chance to win the World Series. Because of him. He goes out there three times. He gives you a chance to win three different games. I totally agree with that. I give Dodgers edge as well. And I think it's going to come down to um, our pitchers, you know. Uh, you got Kershaw, again, has not been, has not looked as uh, as great in the previous postseason yes. as he has now. Um, we both agree on that. Um, but also, which is interesting because it can be a toss-up. The reason why I say that is only five batters that have uh, gone up against either pitcher, either um, Kukul or Kershaw, more than 10 times. Um, that being said, you know, we're kind of uh, 
terrain that we have not you know wandered before. So this is going to be kind of interesting to see that. Um, but again, I still side with Kershaw. He's a three and zero in the postseason. Um, he is slacking in the in the strikeouts, sixteen to twenty five. Yes. Um, but I think the uh, I guess I, I rely heavily on the pitchers. Yes. If you look at uh, the Astros when they lost to the Yankees, um, in in the three games that they that they lost, they let up a ridiculous amount of nineteen runs. So that's what happened though. You saw early on in the series in the postseason, excuse me, Houston went through Boston, was pretty much an easy ride through there. They were up two nothing, lost the one game in Boston, they won the next night. The problem has been the bullpen and the back of the bullpen for yep. Houston. They've given up a lot of runs. The difference between Houston and LA, in my opinion, is the back of the bullpen. Now you have sure. Ken Giles, a closer for Houston. He's been great all year long. You've had also people that need to step up. This now in the postseason, you go to a three or four man starting rotation, and then you move some of your starters in your bullpen. Uh, it's been different for LA though, because LA, in my opinion. They have Kershaw, they have Hugh Darvish, and now they have Hill coming out there as their three pitchers. And then in the back of the bullpen, you have Kenley Jansen, who's been pretty much the best reliever in all of baseball all year long. He's been dominant all throughout the postseason as well. So usually you even see sometimes when you get to the postseason, a change of some guys choke in the pressure when the light, the biggest lights are on the stage. Sure. Sometimes people choke. This year you've seen, as you said, Kershaw's been dominant. Um, but yeah, so the road to get here. L.A. went through Arizona, a division rivalry. Then they played Chicago Cubs, the defending World Series champs of last year who beat the Indians, and now they're playing Houston. Houston took a little road, though. Houston went through the biggest two names, the two biggest names in the AL. They went to the Boston Red Sox and now the New York Yankees. New York had them on the ropes. They were up 3-2 after winning three straight games in New York. It's been a home, home team affair here in this postseason, and right now in the, in the World Series this year, it's, it's in the past, it's been whoever won, has won the wild card game, but now... It's the best record. And right now the best record in baseball all year long has been the LA Dodgers. They have four games at home. That should be a huge advantage for them. Yeah, for sure. And um, like I said, I think it's going to come down to the first five innings. Okay. Um, if if either the Dodgers get on the board early with more than a couple runs, I think that uh, Houston has shown time and time again that if you get on the board before the first five innings yeah. um, and Hugo can't finish and can't close and can't go more than four or five innings, then they're done. Like I said, you look at these games um, collectively. In three games, they lost to the Yankees, 19 runs, and it wasn't um, was eight runs in one game, six in another, five in another. So there's a consistency right there. Um, that being said, when they don't let up runs, like the three wins that they had, um, uh, I'm sorry, the four wins against the Yankees, they only let up three runs. You know, so I think it's going to come down to just whoever can get on the board early. Um, and we actually were just watching the game a couple yes. minutes ago, um, and a, another key. Factor I thought I think is going to be um, in this in this game in this series is going to be Bregman. He bats second against all lefty pitchers. Yes. You're going against Clayton Kershaw, debatably the best lefty pitcher. Yes. Um, and we just saw he went he, yard. He does. He went yeah, yard the second. You know, third, so, excuse me. So that being said, again, I think it's going to be a toss up. But I still I'm with you, Bobby, on that one. Um, I'm going to LA. You going to LA? How many games? Uh. I'm not sure. Again, I, I'm, I'm going to give them a slight edge. So, I mean, it, it can be, it can be a, a toss-up in, into either team. These teams uh, are very, very similar. Let me get back to the similarity train before I give you my prediction. Both teams traded at the All-Star break for very, very good starting pitching. Houston went on the road, or excuse me, went to Detroit and ended up getting Justin Verlander, a unbelievable pitcher, Cy Young winner previously. And then L.A. went out and went to Texas. Uh, just north of Houston and went to Arlington. They end up getting Hugh Darvish, another really, really good young pitcher. Not young anymore. He's actually 30 years old. But he's been dominant so far since going, getting over to L.A. So they both got new pitchers. Darvish will pitch game three. Verlander has been an absolute stud starter for Houston this entire postseason. He's going next game. And they both got dominating K pitchers. I mean, K is in strikeouts. K is in the last name. You have Kershaw and Keuchel. Keuchel's been outstanding this year. He got hurt again earlier this year, just like Kershaw did. But they are guys who you just put every, you put the team on your back. They go out there, they're going to throw seven, eight innings and hopefully get the win for the team. This game is important, especially for Houston. They can get a loss or get through without giving Kershaw a win. That's one time out of the three times you're going to see him. You get a win, that gives you all the momentum moving forward. And also these guys have so many young guys. We'll go through the lineups here in Houston. They got George Springer, 28 years old, leadoff batter. Altuve, the best hitter in the AL. I, it could be in the NL too. Could be of all baseball. I like Joey Votto a lot. 
He's up there. Bryce Harper's also up there. He's 27 years old. Like you said, Alex Bregman, 23 at third base, the hot corner. And then the shortstop, Carlos Correa. Amazing, amazing guy from Puerto Rico. He's 23 years old, younger than myself. So you got to give the hats off to that. Cody Bellinger on the other side of the diamond, though, for the Dodgers, 22. Uh, Springer, 23. Yasiel Puig from Cuba, 26. And then Chris Taylor, who led off the World Series for the Dodgers with the home run, is 27. He's, I mean, there's so many contradicting stuff to both these teams. They're very, very similar. Uh, yeah, in my opinion, though, I think Houston gets in seven games. I was thinking the same, but for the Dodgers. And um, I'm thinking it's going to be all to Yasiel's uh, new, new, new Mohawk. New Mojo, bro. It's all yeah, blue. Yeah. I, like, I like the blue. But yeah. then you go look at the past teams, though. The Rockies in the wild card game, all those guys dyed their hair purple too, and they were out one game. So keep an eye on that. <laughs> I got the Houston Astros in right. seven games. You have the Dodgers, just period. Doesn't matter what. I'm thinking seven as well, though. Seven. I mean, I hope it's a great series. So let's get moving on here to college football. All righty. All right, guys, if you're watching this right now, please write it. You can share it for us. You want to go to that? Yeah, I'm right here. I got you. you. Can share it for your friends back in Jersey, right? You want to hear back it up a little bit? You press share? Yep. Okay, cool. Let's do it. I've got it. And now we're going to college football. This week, the 330 games all over college football are amazing. We'll go game by game and we'll give our prediction. I'm going to name all three games off. We'll leave the Ohio State game for last because obviously that affects everyone watching here in Columbus the most. That's where most of our viewers are. Oh, wait. I owe. Penn State comes to town, the number two in the nation. They're playing Ohio State. Ohio State is favored by six and a half. Raised a lot of eyebrows. Ohio State is rocking their new gray jerseys. They're having a blackout uh, in the shoe this Saturday afternoon. Uh, Georgia is going to Florida. Georgia's ranked third in the nation. Uh, resurrection down there in the Georgia Bulldogs SEC area. Yes, sir. Uh, other than them in Alabama, it's pretty much a two-dog race there in the SEC. Some crazy stuff out of Florida. I'll talk about that in a little bit later. Georgia's favored by 14 points on the road. Also very eye-opening there. And then NC State ranked 14, the Wolfpack. Take on Notre Dame, who's ranked 9 after Notre Dame. Just slaughtered USC last week. A uh, huge game there against the Trojans. Notre Dame is favored by 7.5 points. So some pretty big spreads here by some very good teams. We'll talk about this Georgia Bulldog game first. They go on the road to Florida Gators. McIlwain, the coach there down in Florida, came out today and said his players and himself – have gotten some death threats. Um, and he came out, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, they started 3-3 they started three and three this season, the Florida, Florida Gators. you got to realize this as, as a fan, folks. College football is a minuscule of life. Whether Ohio State wins or loses this Saturday, life will move on to Sunday. Obviously, this town revolves around being a national championship every year, national champion every year, but it doesn't make sense to me as the fact is, okay, you the the Gators started out bad. They weren't supposed to be great this year. Right. And you start three and three, you're getting death threats. The college, these are kids. Yeah, I mean, if, I mean, this I kind of reminiscent of if you recall last year, our, our own kicker here um, was getting a bunch of death threats. Yeah, Tyler well. Durbin. Yeah. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think he transferred out. Didn't he? No, he graduated. Oh, I mean, okay. there's been there's been multiple things with Ohio State players in the past. They mess up on a play. Ryan Hansby, the tight end. Who ended up playing against Texas, the Texas Longhorns, the year Vince Young won the national championship for Texas. He had a touchdown pass in the end zone. If you haven't seen this play, go to YouTube right now, type in Ryan Hansby, dropped catch. Uh, he had the ball, got hit, and he popped it out and dropped it. Um, could, have won us, could have won Ohio State a football game and got them in a national championship for that year. He had death threats, never really bounced back after that. So, I mean, it's in my opinion, it's nuts. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I totally agree with you. I think at the end of the day, it's a game. I mean, um, you can yeah. boo, I'm sure. You can, you can get upset. I get, don't get me wrong. I mean, I would I, never threaten someone's life, though, over yeah. a football game, uh, especially a, a college game. As a student here at OSU, I actually happened, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we had um, the pleasure of us playing intramural. Yes. And um, Durbin was actually going to join our soccer team. Uh, really? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, like I said, I, I, obviously I was pissed. You know, he has done a great job. That being said, though, at the end of the day, it is just a sport. Um, I love OSU. Yeah. Love Columbus, but... I wouldn't do something wild. That's a little nutty. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's crazy. Now, did you work last Saturday night? Um, I did. You did? Okay. So, I don't know if you saw the game, but Notre Dame absolutely kicked butt against South or USC. Excuse me. Same time that was going on, Penn State destroyed Michigan. Demolished. 
so both games last Saturday night were pretty boring in my opinion. They also had the game seven of the ALCS between the Astros and the Yankees going on, so I was usually watching that because all the other football games were blowouts. Yeah. But NC State's been pretty quiet there in the ACC. They're ranked 14th in the nation. They're going to Notre Dame. They're underdogs by seven and a half. Now Notre Dame just played a very. I, I understand they blew out USC, but it's still a tough game on paper. Do you uh, think North Carolina State can cover that spread? No. No. I don't think so. You think um, Notre Dame's that the real deal this year? I, I think so. They've been looking. They've been looking all right. Um, and actually, it's a little uh, pre, um, a little early, but I, I um, one of my hot takes is that uh, Notre Dame could. Honestly, they, they could make that that that. Final four. Um, g- I mean, depends on. I'm not gonna lie to you. Depends on what they do at at, at NC State. That's um one of my hot takes that they could uh, sneak into that fourth that fourth spot. Okay. Um, all right. I'm not a full believer just yet. Um, remains to be seen, but come this week, um, I either will be a full-time believer or I will not. So Notre Dame's a little interesting. Uh, for all the Catholic fans out there watching, it's tough to have Notre Dame in the Final Four over a Power 5 conference team just because they don't play in a conference championship. Now you look at their schedule, yes, their schedule is very, very good. Up and down, they play teams all over the ACC this year that are ranked. Uh, they they play NC State this week, who end up getting ranked. They uh, Their only loss this year is at Georgia. Uh, it was at home against Notre Dame. Georgia came up. They lost by one. That was before everyone believed in the hype with Georgia. Uh, to finish the year, though, they got some tough games. They go on the road at the Miami Hurricanes. Miami right now is undefeated. The, uh, the only undefeated team left in the ACC. Clemson lost a couple weeks ago to Syracuse. Uh, Miami's ranked eighth in the nation. And then they finish up the year at Stanford. Now, Stanford and Notre Dame, the last couple of years they've played have been absolute great games. So do not just buy. I mean, I want to buy into Notre Dame and possibly them making a Final Four, but in my entire lifetime, they've always choked at the end of the year. That's how I've always seen them. Now, Kelly's got his team going right now. They, 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 uh, they got rid of all their quarterbacks last year with Kaiser, uh, now in, playing for the Cleveland Browns. Yes, sir. And then the other quarterback, I forget his name, is actually down in Florida. Uh, for the Florida Gators, but NC State's a tough game, and they have a cakewalk against, against Wake Forest, and they go on the road to Miami. So if they can get past that Miami, Navy, Stanford to end the three games of the year, and they're still with one loss, they're going to be right there at five or six and possibly in that four spot. So it's going to be tough to see what happens with the committee. The committee's rankings come out in two weeks, so it's going to be interesting where they have them as well. Let's go to the game of, this, of the week. Game day, Fox's game day, Big Ten Network's game day. Oh. Yes. Here in Columbus, Ohio, folks, Penn State, the team that uh, beat Ohio State last year in the regular season, is coming to town. They are undefeated. They've beaten everybody bad, except Iowa. The game uh, about a month ago in Iowa City at night, Hawkeyes game will run for the money. Ohio State, in my opinion, is a little better than Iowa. It's a 3-30 game. They're, they're having a blackout for the shoe. Ohio State's favored by 6.5. What goes on? All right, man. I'm telling you right now, we're all going to be. Everyone's been doubting JT Barrett. Um, yes. We're going to put that to rest during this game. Um, our linebackers are, are going to do everything we need them to do. Our defense is going to come to play. I think this game is going to cement Benjamin Victor um, as a true and great wide receiver. Why they always compare him to AJ Green? It will be cemented this game. Quote me. Um, I'm quoting and, you. There. And I think Benjamin Victor and Dobbins are going to be our our players of the game. Um, and I just don't think Saquon's really going to do what we've done before. I don't think he's going to do it to us. I think he's destroyed his last two years. I, I, I was there two years I, I, ago. Ohio State won the game. Uh, it was a pretty cold game, if I remember. I don't think it rained. It rained in the Michigan State game I went to that year. Saquon ran all over us. He was a sophomore then. I mean, he's not, he's been up and down with Ohio State. He, if he wins this game, he's going to be the Heisman Trophy winner, 100%. I will say that if JT goes out there and continues to do what he's been doing, I think this will also finally uh, give him the clout that he, he needs to actually be a candidate for the Heisman. Okay. Um, I, I've been saying this year, after, I mean, he comes to play, he's been doing really well. If you look at his numbers right now, he's killing it. And I just think our defensive line is going to get a ton of pressure. Okay. Um, and I think, like I said, we're going to respond well. Um, and... Yeah, we, we got this W coming in for sure. I'm for thinking, sure. I'm thinking two, I'm thinking double-digit win. Wow. Wow. That's a bold statement by Juan, my friend here. I don't know. The problem I have with JT is ever since his freshman year, right your freshman year when we went to the national championship, he got hurt against that Michigan Wolverine team, broke his ankle. 
he just has not stepped up in a game, a big game we needed him to step up in. He's always been a just scared to throw the ball downfield kind of guy. Uh, hesitant on his throws. We saw in that Oklahoma game, nothing was clicking at all, at all with us. Uh, we've reeled off five wins since then. I've looked very, very good, though. I mean, don't get me wrong. Ohio State looks great against these cupcake teams, though. I mean, you can't say Maryland or Nebraska are top-tier teams. Nebraska used to be maybe eight years ago, ten years ago, but not anymore. I got JT Barrett. If he can come out and show me he he can step up in a pocket and throw a nice ball downfield, then, yeah, sure, I'll buy into the hype. But I saw what he was freshman year to this year. It's just a complete regression. He has not stepped up. The defense is secondary. It might be raining, hopefully, so they don't get picked on like they did against Indiana and Oklahoma. But our front eight, our front seven, with with Jerome Baker, who was on this podcast, sitting in your seat about three months ago, our defensive front with Nicky Bosa, Sam Hubbard, Taekwon Lewis. I mean, these guys are the best defensive front in all college football going against the best offense in all college football. Now, our offense is nowhere near to their offense. It can be sometimes. But the question is, can our offense step up? Can the new play calling with Kevin Wilson be enough to overpower their defense? And can we get the ball in the end zone more? Because touchdowns will absolutely out perform any team that goes down there and kicks field goals in the red zone. You've got to be able to score touchdowns. Yeah, we have 21 touchdowns and Barrett, only one interception. You know? It's he's been iffy. Hey, he's been iffy. You're going you're going maybe. against very lackluster competition the last couple of weeks. Uh, tomato tomato. Tomato tomato. Burrito burrito. But I don't know. Six and a half is a huge spread for us. I can see us winning by a field goal. A win's a win in my opinion, no matter what. Whether we I beat agree. the spread or not, we need a win this week. We lose this week. We're still in October and the season's over. Unfortunately, you need you yeah. need to have one loss or less to get in that final four. Ohio State wins here; they're gonna put, we will jump up to the top four easily. We'll jump over Wisconsin. Penn State will fall behind us. We'll be a absolute control your own destiny to the final four. So with this win, you put us in at what? Right now we're sitting at six. We're sitting at six right now. If we win this week, we jump over Wisconsin at five. We easily jump over Penn State, who's at two. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm, I'm thinking we. I think we would sit at two seed. I don't think I think Georgia Bulldogs sitting undefeated right now will end up passing us, but I think we might be that three seed right now. We pass over TCU. TCU is a tough game this week, but nothing compares to the number two Nittany Lions right now, who absolutely destroyed a top twenty team last week in Michigan. I know Michigan's fallen off the last couple of weeks, but absolutely Ohio State is in that top four realm. So I mean, it doesn't matter because as long as you make the top four, that's all that matters. Yeah, sure. That's, yep. So exactly. So I make I make the dance. All right, that's all we got for college football. Let's go to the M, or excuse me, NBA, folks. If you're a your Cavs fan, Warriors fan, or any other team that won't make the finals fan, come on <laughs> in, take a seat, because we got a lot of NBA. Hell this yeah. is Juan Vasquez next to me. He's our new NBA expert here in Columbus, Ohio. When I do the podcast here in my living room, uh, let's get started here. Um, let's talk about the slow starts. The NBA got started last week. A uh, couple teams got started off very, very slow. The Golden State Warriors, who absolutely throttled everybody last year in the postseason, they went 16 and one last postseason. Yes, the did. best team I've ever seen, ever, ever. That team was incredible. Uh, started off a one and two start. They won last night, so now they are back to that 500 range. Uh, what's going on? What 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 other slow starts we got to we got to uh, talk about? I think it's pretty simple. If you compare uh, the Warriors, and which is why they've been such a great team in the past couple of years, is that they. They move the ball. Yes. They move the ball around very well. So if you compare right now, it's again we only have a handful of games. I hate doing these kind of comparisons with um, only four games. It yes. gives you a little bit of you don't have enough to go off. But isolation offense. Let's let's address yes. that first. It has right now it's at an eight point four percent versus compared to last year, which is at a five point seven. Um, that three percent spike is a lot. They're playing ISO ball. That is not the Warriors style of play. That's not a Steve Kerr's uh, style of play. So this is what's really been affecting them, is its isolation offense. And on top of that, paired with that, is their defensive rating. Um, if you look at their defense last year, they were the second best defensive team, second only to the San Antonio Spurs. Yep. Now they are the third worst in the league um, with regards to defensive rating. So I think right there we kind of summed up what we have. Um, I, you said it, though. I mean, it's, it's a short sample size. You can't, I mean, the, t- the, the season is 82 games long. <clears throat> we're sitting at four games into the season. Yeah, you could say it's a championship hangover, but these guys don't care. Yeah, I mean they could be they can go 
50 and whatever, and they'll still make the playoffs. You can win 48 games in a season, go like 10 games over 500, and they'll still make the NBA playoffs. And then at that point, it's a, it's a toss-up. I mean, sure, last year they were the best team in the West. And then you have that Cavs who were the two seed. But, I mean, it's a question, in my opinion, is there any other team right now that could stop these two teams? The Cavs or the Warriors? Yes. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, I'm not sold on the Cavaliers. I will say this. I am not 100% sold on them. I think that, um, I, I mean, you got you got to address a couple a couple of issues. You know, we have, uh, obviously, Dwayne Wade going to the bench. Yes, um, let's talk about that. What's going yeah, on with that? So, Dwayne Wade, um, as you guys know or do not know, Dwayne Wade has never, as in his career of uh, 11, 15 seasons, yes. has only come off the bench a crazy 11 times. That's it. Only eleven times out he's of. He's been a starter. He's been a two or three his entire career. No, most definitely. That's what I'm saying. So out of fifteen seasons, you have a man that has only come off the bench eleven times. Yes. Who now has asked his Tyron Lue, the coach, um, assistant coach to LeBron James. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true. Has now has asked him um, to move to the bench, uh, in in turn in favor for J.R. Smith. J.R. Smith is another, another one of my players that is kind of hit or miss. He's a real reckless shooter. Um, does real reckless plays. Um, which. Can get you that win, but can also when he goes 0 for seven, when he's one for one for eight from the three point line, he becomes a cancer. Exactly. So I um, I think that the best move the Cavaliers made, to be honest, was acquiring Jay Crowder. Okay. You're looking to stop DeAndre Jordan. You're looking for a defensive presence, someone that can shut down, uh, be a shut down defender, and you have that in Jay Crowder, very athletic. My problem with the Cavaliers again is that you have. Derrick Rose, who's looking all right, but he um, every time he falls, tell me my only person who holds their breath, every time you see him land on his ankle, we think it's done. Yeah. You have Isaiah Thomas, who still has not played a game in that a guy's Cavaliers all, uniform. He's going to be a walking cripple. And so you bring in uh, Isaiah Thomas, which does what to your, to your team? It removes uh, any potential defense. So it makes your team a lot shorter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Liability. <laughs> Most definitely. And, as I said, the defensive presence is, is gone there. Um... So, and what you need to combat, you can't go against the Warriors in a straight shootout. Yes. Um, and not with the firepower the Cavs are bringing. No. And you're not going to shut down uh, Stephen Curry with a, uh, a a great offensive-minded and a great passing point guard in Isaiah Thomas, but almost invisible with regard to, to defense. Uh, we haven't seen him yet. We haven't seen how he plays with the team. So that remains to be seen. But I am not sold on the Cavaliers, uh, to be completely honest. Um, they're worse with Isaiah Thomas on the team uh, defensively. They're going to get um, pickpocketed with him. They're going to, you know, bully him all day. I I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not so with the Cavaliers. I look, I look at the roster right now. You've got LeBron James guarding Kevin Durant. That's a given. Yes. you got to have the best player guarding their best player. Now, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, who are going to guard them? I have no idea. You have a liability in a center there with, with Tristan Thompson, $80 million center, who got outreached by Steph Curry, who I said that all postseason last year. The guy can't do anything down low. He's a softy big time. You got Isaiah Thomas, who's so short. You and I can shoot over him, which is scary. I mean, it's scary. We're not NBA material at all. Yeah, for and sure. And the guy's your point guard. Now, let's go back to the Warriors real quick. A couple nights ago, some drama happened Saturday night <laughs> with KD and, and Steph getting yeah. Both ejected from a game. Obviously, it was game three. They lost the game. They started out one and two. They won last night against the Mavericks. What happened? I, I, will, I will say this, and I said this about two seasons ago, and I will say it again. Everyone, it, it goes behind Steph Curry as if, you know, he is this uh, great – I mean, he is a – don't get me wrong. He's a, an amazing point guard, one of yes. the best shooters we've seen thus far in the history of basketball. Um, he's also one of the cockiest players in the league, and people seem to not notice. Well, nice, got two rings, you should be cocky. No, no, fair you enough. You earn your greatness. That's exactly what they always say, earn greatness. And he's yeah. earned it. You won two times. I don't know if you earned the right to throw your mouthpiece at a, at he's a got great. I don't think he meant to throw it at the ref, but he's got great aim. What can you say? He's a great, he's a great <laughs> he's a athlete. Shooter. He's, yeah. a shoot. he's a shooter. He's a shooter. Right. Throw shoot or shoot. Hell yeah, shoot your shot. But <laughs> my thing with that is that I think that, um, and KD as well, he actually has been leading the leagues this past couple seasons with um, – or has always been in the top four for um, technicals. And so people seem dumbfounded and stupefied by the fact that KD and Steph are getting ejected. And if you, again, if you look at the seasons, time and time again, Steph is always celebrating, very cocky, very in your face, very dramatic, um, you know, does his shot, walks away. Obviously, he's shooting at a ridiculous percentage, so you can do that. But 
that kind of a behavior leads you to doing these kind of antics. I understand that, but you got to look at it. So I know this is a different sport, but Conor McGregor. For sure. He's very loud, very arrogant. But in your opponent's mind, it's like, oh my goodness, I'm going against this guy. This guy's already in your head. He's won the battle. He's already won 50% of the battle. I mean, that didn't work out too well with Nate Diaz or Floyd Mayweather. One time. That's fine, though. He's still times. getting paid way more money than no, all no, of us. No, no, I hear you. I mean, no, is, it, is their behavior warranted? If that's what you're asking me? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Gears, that's what I would say. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think that people are surprised by this, and I think that that's a little bit... If you're watching the NBA, you shouldn't be that surprised. Again, KD... Almost season and season in season out has led the league in technicals. Um, nice. If not led, he's in the top five for most technicals received. And everyone again goes behind his mom. He's a big mama's boy, so she kind of softens that image up. You got Steph Curry with his wife Aisha Curry. The whole family image is there. I love the family there. Yeah, <laughs> I love Aisha. Yeah, um, you know, but I still stand by this. I don't think this is something that's like an outlier. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if the ejections were warranted, but if you ever do throw a mouthpiece at a referee, that is, you will be ejected. Oh, no, you should that. be. I'm not saying you yeah. should be ejected. I'm saying it doesn't matter. And the best part about the whole thing we're not even mentioning, when they kick KD out, you obviously know that over the off season that he does not like fans coming at him. He's very, <laughs> very soft. Okay, and he says soften up his thing with his mother. Some fan was yelling at him. What do you do? He pointed right to the fan and says, "I got my ring. I got my ring." Point to the, it was they're playing Dallas or the, yeah. who they played that night. Uh, uh, they were not playing Dallas. They beat Dallas last night. Let me go to their uh, schedule. But he was pointing to the fans saying, "I got my ring." I mean, oh, they played Memphis. Memphis has not got a ring. So, in my opinion, I think that's that's a pretty funny argument. Like, dude, I got thrown out of game three games in the season. Who cares? Because Memphis, you'll never have this. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think it adds to the feistiness. And I've actually been a big fan. Of the, I, I, I've uh, been an NBA watcher for. A bunch of years now um and i've said it i, I love that old 90s basketball style you get that back. yeah you want that you you i mean you don't want your friend you don't want to to tweet at your your opponent hey what's up like you know the, no you should be mad i want you to be it's you're going against them man this is your profession your job you should go out there with some kind of aggressiveness a rivalry yeah, rivalry for makes sure. come on man rivalry yeah. makes it's, it's okay to, to to be competitive it's okay to to get upset you know i want to i want to see some fervor i want to see some of that stuff and I want to bring it back to when um, I mean they were, they were saying back in the nineties like people were throwing elbows and uh, this happened in the eighties. Yeah, they were throwing punches. They didn't care. I mean, have you seen Tropic Thunder? Uh, what, no, what's that? Um, Will Ferrell basketball? Yeah, movie? Tropic Thunder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, every time the lights went off, they were just start just stra- yeah, 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 just straight up. You know, I'm, I'm not. I don't want it to go to that level, but I want people to be able to. I hate this whole diving stuff. I hate this whole like, calling a foul every time. Like, let the let the boys play. It started with the Cavs. Though. You had Vergeau. Vergeau was the guy that started flopping. Yeah, LeBron was the king of flopping. If you remember, one hundred percent. LeBron's king of everything. Flopping is one of them. One hundred percent. That's go. why everyone hates Draymond Green too. He touches too hard. All right, let's let's switch things up here. Touching too hard injuries. Oh man, yes. We got some to talk huge. About. I know we're four games in the season, but there are some guys that are lost for a long time. And a guy that is out for all the entire year. I mean, let's talk about Boston. What's going on? That happened the first ten minutes of the ball game. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the most gruesome injuries. Uh, out there with Paul George. Yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, it, it reminds me reminiscent of, of that Paul George. And um, I always get so I'm mean, not so much upset because you don't see it when it's happening live, and then they run it right back, and then they zoom in. It was, I mean, that it, it looked terrible. I feel you know I feel for all the Boston fans watching any. I mean, any NBA fan, you should feel for, for this kind of an injury. Yes. And I think the whole NBA came together, coalesced, and actually has been supporting him and whatnot. Um, well, I mean, why wouldn't you support a guy that got, just got yeah, broke think, his yeah, ankle and, like I that? I mean, you had so much. And again, the, the, the Boston Celtics traded away their star point guard. But I've said this time and time again, that the Celtics actually came out on top, I believe, yes. in that trade, uh, receiving Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving. Um, not from the same trade, but they, they, they came out, I believe. And I think... Gordon sitting out is um, in no way a positive for Boston. Uh, it's a really rough blow to a team that's looking to find a new identity, a new entire direction. I had them playing the Cavaliers in seven games in the NBA, at the Eastern Conference Finals. Now he's out for the year. I think the Cavaliers are going to have a walkthrough to the championship again. It's going to be, in my opinion, I know you don't trust the Cavs and you're not buying them yet, but I don't see that anyone stopping them in, in the Eastern, Eastern Conference way. Okay, I... Um, and this uh, this is gonna sound real ridiculous and kind of crazy, but I will say that in the Eastern, I don't think they have a chance of of competing against the uh, the Cavaliers. But I will say that um, 
You can't sleep on on the Philadelphia 76ers. It's, yeah, not it's, this year. I'm it's, saying it's, maybe it's, in a couple of years, trust the process. But right now, I do not see any team walking into Cleveland for seven games, for four games actually, because be, Cleveland should have the number one seed and beating them four or multiple times. I mean, four times in a series. I just don't see it happening. I think Cleveland's got this. But who else? Let's go. Let's keep. let stay on the, the injury bug train. What's what else? Who else has got it hurt? We so. also have Jeremy Lin out for the season out in Brooklyn. Um, he went down, and I believe he tweeted after I'm done with this or I'm done with, with. Uh, I forget what the exact tweet how it read, but it led the it, it led the people to believe that um, it was some kind of um, a retirement kind of a a tweet. And um, yeah, he's down for the season, which actually has given room for. Um, Myself being a Lakers fan, all my Lakers fans out there, what up? Uh, <laughs> um, I think uh, it's given room for an ex-Laker in D'Angelo Russell to finally come into his mold, and he has been lighting people up. He is the second player in Brooklyn history to ever average in the first three games, 21 points and seven assists, second only to Sam Cassell. Yeah, yeah, Sam Cassell, old Sam Cassell. Yeah, old, ugly, alien Sam Cassell. Old looking. Yeah, man, he was something to look at. Um, or not to. But, um, yeah, so continuing with that injury bug. Um, who else do we have that Chris went Paul. down? Chris Paul. Chris Paul down for the Rockets. And actually, interesting thing here. What uh, what do you think? Are the Rockets better with Chris Paul, worse without him? How are they in comparison to It last does not years? matter, folks. you got to realize they have a egotistic, ball-handling I guess you could call him like an NBA god right now with Harden. But the problem is, like, even saw in the games he was playing with Harden, it was go stand in the corner, Chris Paul. I got it. This is my, my team, my ball. And that's the problem when you have these guys on these teams with multiple egos. There's only one ball to share. And when you have, say, even like a Russell, uh, Russell Westbrook, excuse me, he's been on a team by himself the last year. He's only had the ball in his hands because no one else can take the ball from him. You add Paul George to him, it still don't, I don't think it's going to matter. You add Melo, I don't think it's going to matter. You go to Houston, you get Chris Paul, it's not going to matter. Now that he's out, it's still going to be the, the James Harden show. I, I will say this, um, with respect to the Chris Paul scenario, the Rockets are actually better with Chris Paul on the bench than they are with him on the floor. They have more wins, they score more, all around a better team um, thus far without Chris Paul on the court. Um, and I do think that James Harden, if you've watched the games thus far that have been going on, you will you will note that Chris Paul is not the point guard that he was um, in, no. in, in L.A. He is he is a pass first, of course, but he has been averaging, I think, under 15 points. Um, his all-career lows, I believe. Um, he's not doing the things that he was doing. Again, it's only a very small sample size, I understand. But in that sample size... They have been winning though, which is um, they haven't played too much com competition. They have been winning, and it's been, as you said, it's been a James Harden show. Been. He's been running it by himself. Um, that's what he does. But you touched on another topic I wanted to address: the OKC Thunder, which I actually was not a believer of prior to, or I'm sorry, after the trades and whatnot. Um, did not believe in them at all whatsoever. You can ask all my friends. I thought it was going to be um, all three players need the balls at their hands. Yes, um, they need it. Carmelo is. Needs the ball. He's a very ISO player. You have the same thing in Russell Westbrook, which is a drive first, head down point guard. Did not see anything happening there. Russell Westbrook has convinced myself and a few analysts in the NBA uh, realm that he can play the point guard position. But the problem is he's they're one and two right now in OKC. I mean, yeah, it's, again, it's a short sample size, but they. I mean, the, the one and two could have easily been a two and one with that last minute yep. loss. That, to that should have been so the foul. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, if you saw, I mean, uh, what happened there? Uh, was it Russ or, or or Paul George gave that ball up? They're able to move the ball around and gave it to a, a spot up shooter who has become now a spot up shooter, which I was not sure he could do. He's doing it very well in Carmelo Anthony, and he hit that three, which put them ahead. And then there was a bunch of mayhem fouls ensued last minute. Andrew Wiggins, uh, another uh, any fantasy players out there, please pick him up. He's amazing, or you know, make a trade for him. Um, he did hit that last winning last minute three to end up winning by a point. So the record is one and two now. Could have been two and one. Um, that goes either or, you know. Um, so let's talk about teams that have not won a game yet. You have the New York Knicks. They've only played two. They're 0 and 2. Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls are 0 and 3. And then you got Dallas. And then you have Dallas, who's 0 and 3. Now let's stay in the West, though, because there's a team that just fired the coach. They just won a game. 
Uh, the Phoenix Suns. The Phoenix Suns, yes. The uh, third fastest high, or tired for second fastest firing in the NBA season, three games in. Uh, interesting stories out of there. You got players that say they don't want to be there, then saying he's at the salon. What's going on? <laughs> What's going on with the whole Phoenix situation? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so apparently um, we have uh, Eric Bledsoe, right, who, has, yes. who was asked out of, has asked to, um, supposedly didn't ask to actually leave. He, um, he said he's at the salon. Yeah, he said, I don't want to be here, was uh, quoted verbatim that he put on his, uh, was it Instagram or Twitter? Twitter. He tweeted yeah, he put out. out. Yeah, he tweeted out, I don't want to be here, which prompted the GM, the general manager of the team, to then call him. Um, I mean, you can't say that as, 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 uh, as the debatable, I would say Devin Booker or Bledsoe, but debatably the best player of your franchise, tweets out, I don't want to be here. I think that's grounds for the GM. Yeah, to definitely call you and say, you know, you know, what's going on. But if you look at his past, though, uh, tweets and Twitter rants, his tweets are never in content. It's always random, random stuff. So obviously, like they were saying, like he could have made an excuse, like, oh, he was hacked or he didn't mean to tweet that. But that's what he came up with was he was in the salon. I mean, yeah, he was in the salon with his girlfriend. Apparently, he was not having a good time. And so I, I wouldn't be, be happy if my girlfriend was at it was at a salon. I'd go watch her. Listen, I, mean, I don't have a but girlfriend, but I would not be happy to go see her. Be like sit in a salon all day. Like, yeah, you do your thing. That's your part of the day. I'm gonna stay at home. I'll see you home shortly. Can we can we agree that that he's in a different position and that he is the face of the franchise? He has some responsibilities. Their team is 0 and 3, having getting blown out by 20 plus points every single game. Do you think that there is you have to have a little bit more responsibility. But what about what, what about LeBron though? LeBron tweets out of context all the time. So it's random random stuff like what, just trying to stir the stir up the pot in the media world. I will say this: LeBron's in a very different situation. As I, I joked before, you know he is the head coach of the, of the of the Cavaliers. The man has a lot more clout on in Cleveland for Cleveland. I mean, he can pretty much do and say as he pleases. There was that one game where Tyron Lue told him to come out, and he proceeded to play. Nothing happened. Never got suspend. Never got any kind of a warning or a fine. Suspend, nothing. Yeah. What I'm saying, as a coach, you would have to sit down and, and let him know that there is a level of a hierarchy here where I'm the coach, you're the player. LeBron doesn't abide by those rule, those rules, you know. So okay. fair enough. Now, do you think do you think the uh, Suns can bounce back after this? Now they they're on a, they won a game. They're one and three now. Can they make the playoffs in the West? Well, I mean, how long is 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 Jay Schreier going to stay as their interim coach? I don't know who they're going to get for a coach. As long as, as long as they keep winning, I don't think they're going to change that up. Anytime. Yeah, and I mean, they are, and people do forget that they are also one of the youngest Whoa. players in, uh, the youngest teams in the uh, in the league. You got the Orlando Magic and the Sixers, I believe, right up there in the mix. Even the Lakers, throw them in there. But the Suns are, are also a, re they're re-imaging, regrouping, restarting. Um, and I think, I think that the move um, right now is, what, what remains to be seen is what they're going to do with that trade. Is wh Who are they going to get for Eric Bledsoe, right? You can either... And from what I've been looking at, I think that the um, there's two potential trades that I'm actually liking. There's one to the Spurs for for Murray. Okay. Um, the only thing with that is the money doesn't seem to add up. Um, the Spurs are all capped up already, and it doesn't seem like they have any money that they could actually afford. And if that trade were to go down, you take a money cut. You take a pay cut. Yeah, it might happen in January. It couldn't happen right now. But it also, they always say though. If you want to be great, you got to be looked at it ring wise. Do you take a pay cut to join a championship caliber team? Kevin right Durant. now, it, Kevin Durant, yes, but I also look at Ray Allen took a eleven million dollar pay cut. Oh my, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's definitely players around there. I mean, you see guys that do take pay cuts to put themselves in situations like this. Yeah, and I think that the Suns again coming off of they, they've been historically one of the. I mean, just as of late, they have not played very well. Um, they do have some bright young stars in yes. Devin Booker, one of my favorite uh, players, um, in uh, one of my favorite up and coming players. I think that um, another hot take of mine is that De Devin Booker is going to go on to to light the league up. I think he'll he'll uh, eclipse near twenty eight points, okay. twenty six um, per game. Per game, the man. I mean, who I mean, you don't have that much. You don't have that much I going on for you. He is. Uh, you look at the possessions he has. He's got a lot of possessions. He scored. 71 points last season. Um, he's had, his, I think, his first 20 some point game this season or 30 point game. Um, I think you gotta still keep going to him. Devin Booker's gonna be your go to guy now more so than before. Uh, he is a spot up shooter. Been working on his assists a little bit more. They're up from, I think, about an assist. He's been, he's been getting better every year, third season. So I think a lot to be shown for the young man. All right, now another player I forgot to mention with the pay cut Chris Paul, $200 million pay cut. Not a million, he was gonna make $200 million yeah. in, his, in his deal. 
out for a while. I just want to point that one out. And, and if you look at the LA Clippers record, they're 2-0. And, and their actual their uh, starting point guard, uh, Ted, uh, I can look it up his you. name, Ted Dosich, not too uh, familiar with the, the new the new Clippers. Yeah, Milos, and that is, he has his first year, is his first uh, first season here, Milos, uh, first Ted Dosich, uh, he's out. So their starting point guard now also not Austin Coleman. Rivers and Patrick Beverly. Uh, Patrick Beverly being one of the best defensive point guards in the league has embarrassed one of my my the head of the face of my franchise Lonzo Ball. Yep. So Patrick Beverly, you can go. Uh... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's finish this episode up of the podcast with going the f- first week into the superlatives of the NBA. Who's okay. your NBA Defensive Player of the Year? NBA Defensive Player of the Year, I'm going to go with, I think it's hard to not see Kawhi Leonard doing what he always does, um, shutting people down, defensive-minded, best two-way player in the game. Um, I'm going to go with Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard, I'm going to stay on the same same uh, same conference there, but I'm going to go with a two-peat in a row there with Mr. Draymond Green, I love the way he plays basketball and defense. People hate him, but again, if you want the basketball from back in the 80s and 90s to come back, you've got to let him do his thing. Most and that's definitely. my opinion. I think he's a great defense. I mean, you can't go wrong. Both players you have on your team, they play a, a certain skill that no one else has in the NBA, and that's called defense. It, you're not going to see Isaiah Thomas be able to step up or Jared Smith because these guys don't care. Yep, They'd rather score sure. 30 points, which is fine, but you got to stop the team sometimes to win a ball game. Offensive player of the year, the MVP. Who wins the MVP of the NBA this year? The most valuable player I have right now. I have a toss-up. I am a firm believer in another young man that's become one of the greatest hot topics to talk about in the league. Um, has been dominating his team through and through, leading the team last year in almost every okay. single category, Giannis. Okay. Um, I have him as the potential. Greek freak. Yes, sir. He's. Uh, if you look at last season's stats, he led them in points, rebounds, assists, blocks, steals. Um which is absurd for a man of under 25 years old to do. Um, and he's been shooting right now 65.9% from the field. That's 58 out of 88 uh, field goals attempted this season. The only thing he needs to work on is his three-point. He's one of six, shooting at a abysmal 3%. Um, aside from that, I have him going up against uh, one of my double-double machines, Anthony DeBrow Davis. I think he could also be... To me, it's a toss up between either of them. I don't see anyone else doing what they're um, maintaining the pace that, they, that they're showing right now. I can see Giannis, and I can see Anthony Davis continue to put up these colossal numbers throughout the season. Now, I look at last year's MVP in Russell Westbrook. He, he's added some key pieces, so that will affect his numbers, in my opinion, dramatically. I don't, I, he wants to average still a triple double. I mean, if he can do the same numbers they did last year and keep that up somehow, then yes, he'll win it, but I do not think it's going to happen. Uh, I'm looking to LeBron James. I think the guy's been been unlucky the last couple of years. And everyone here that watches me week in and week out knows I do not like LeBron James. LeBron James is, I just don't like him as a player. I mean, player-wise, he's the best player in the game. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes he does off-court stuff that frustrates me. But he he should win the MVP this year. He will not win the NBA championship. But MVP-wise, he should, in my opinion, he will win the MVP this year. One of his last times. I think he, uh, I mean, the reason why he's been so good for so long, unlike Kobe, he dropped off is because he stayed healthy. Yes, he sits out a bunch of games, too. He does. <laughs> I mean, that's not wrong. You're not wrong I'm... about that. So, in my opinion, he should win the MVP this year. Now, the final thing. Who's the NBA Finals going to be, matchup-wise, Eastern or Western Conference, and then who wins it all? So, I have East, I have the West still. Um, I think I think the, the Spurs have rallied behind LaMarcus Aldridge. If anyone has heard in the recent news, LaMarcus has had a lot of difficulty in the past season with the Spurs and where everyone thought he would have been a perfect fit, perfect mesh, and have killed it, dominated. He did not do as well as he thought he did last season. He was not receiving the ball as much as he was last season. He was not shooting as well as he was, um, as he has in previous years. And now, he said he spoke with Greg Popovich, had a sit-down talk with him, told him, you know, I, we got to figure out a way to bring me more into the system. I don't feel comfortable. I'm not as confident. I'm not doing what I think I'm, I should be doing. They have been rallying behind him. He's putting them great numbers. So I think LaMarcus, um, if he continues his work, um, continues to mesh well with, with Greg Pop, with the system, if they trade for Eric Bledsoe and dealing away Murray, I think that you have a potential for the Spurs to topple the Warriors. Aside from that, I don't see 
any I don't see anyone beating the Warriors. Another cra- collision course. I, I'm I'm on. I think I have the the Warriors. It would be my safe bet for the Western Conference Finals in the East. I think that it's a little too early for me to believe in any team just yet. How? I I, I don't how see. How are you saying? How was anyone and anyone? <laughs> I know you're fit with Boston. Boston. You, you lose one of your best players. On the, in my opinion, the best player besides Kyrie. I mean, they're neck and neck. I mean, yeah, for sure. Gordon Hayward is an amazing player. You lose him for the year, and you don't think anyone else can step up? I mean, before that, it was just Boston and, and, and Cleveland. Who was going to win in seven games? If there is no way in hell a team can step up. <laughs> the East is a bunch of high school kids. They are trash. I, I, I'm, if 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 you're relying on just purely LeBron James, he has done it before. He has gotten the Caps to the finals. He has done it by himself with no one else. He's getting a little bit older now. Uh, Dwayne Wade is, what, 35 years old? He's not going to bring anything to the I'm table. Not, that's why he's off the bench. For sure, um, I think that if Isaiah Thomas comes back and and does not produce or is not able to gets injured, if Derrick Rose goes down, you have a team now simply solely re- revolving around LeBron James. You have Kevin Love who needs to put on some muscle, needs to put on that weight, get back to his Minnesota body, yes. and start bullying people down low because they you can bully and pick them apart. I, I give the edge to the Cavaliers in the Eastern Conference. I do not see them coming anywhere near. Um, to sweeping teams, I think they're going to have a tough road to the finals, and I think they're going to get to the finals and get embarrassed if they do get there by the Warriors. Um, they, Unless somehow Isaiah Thomas learns D, and unless somehow um, uh, Kevin Love gains a ton of weight muscle-wise and stops being a, a little bitch and plays the game how he should be playing, yeah. um, how he played it back in Minnesota. And if you have Jr. playing a little bit smarter and hitting those clutch those clutch shots, and you got Jay Crowder being as defensive minded as he should be, it could be a game against the Warriors. All right, so I have the Golden State Warriors running through the West. I have the Cavaliers. In my opinion, they're gonna sweep their whole way through the East. <laughs> Absolutely not, bro. They nothing. Not, no one's gonna <laughs> stop them now. The, the the second best player in the East that isn't on the Cavs just got hurt for the year. Kyrie can't hold a team up by himself. We saw that last year. And this year we have LeBron and the Cavaliers going against the Golden State Warriors in an absolute juggernaut of an offense. We have not mentioned one name all this whole podcast. And Rappers. the reason, what? Uh, Nick <laughs> Young, shooter, Nick shooter, oh guy. My yeah. Stick this guy in the corner. Let KD get the ball. Drive in there. Iso him out there. The dude doesn't miss. If yeah, if you watch the first game, um, I think he hit every single. He scored. He broke the points. record. Yeah. Seven threes for the yeah. Golden State Warriors. He twenty-one broke, points. No yeah. one. First off, if you were said Nick Young was going to break records in the positive way for the Golden State uh, Warriors, you're I, actually, right. no, no. If you had no, if you actually had asked me this last, uh, right before, the, right after they traded him, I said it, and you can and, and people watching, my friends on Facebook Live, uh, please comment in the section. You know, I said this. Nick Young going to the Warriors was possibly one of the best moves for it's him as a player. So he is a he is a rec, he's a better I don't know kind of a J.R. Smith, but he is a pull up shooter. He's he a, a shooter. He's a better shooter than J.R. In my opinion. And he's a a specific a three point specialist. And that's that is all what they he have does. on that yep. team. The whole team their center Draymond Green. I know he's and a he's power coming. forwarder shoots threes all day long when he gets a chance. Yeah, and bringing him off the bench is definitely definitely going to bring again that firepower. And what you want in the in the league now is that. If your starting five is great, you need to have a bench that's not abysmal. You need to have a bench that because if you get a if your bench is getting blown out, your your stars have to make up for that deficit that, that they cause. Um, but in the east, in the east, I will say this: that there are two teams that can still do some work. I'm looking at the Magic with Nuk- with Nikola Vucevic, um, with a great double double machine starting to come into his own, Nikola, um, and then also the Raptors with a great backcourt in Demar Derozan um, and I still do see that, that the Cavs go in there, but it's not going to be an easy road. They're not going to blow, blow through the Bucks. They're not going to blow through the Magic. They're not going to blow through the Raptors. I, I can see them, everyone else, maybe. Boston, maybe. But I don't see this as easy as, as you have it out to be. Well, I'm going to look at Golden State Warriors roster right now. they got Draymond, power forward, Zaza, Pachulia down low. He's a joke of a center, but they have <laughs> to pay somebody. Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Clay Thompson. I mean, they have... Four possible Hall of Famers on this roster right now. They can even go short though. They go small lineup. They can even put Zaza on the bench. They can even put Sean Levingston in there, or they can put Nick Young in there. I mean, even Patrick McCall can shoot. The guys are with garbage time, 
perfect guy to get 20 points on your team. Uh, watch out for the Warriors, folks. It's going to be four times in a row, the Warriors and Cavs going at it. I think the Warriors win this series in five or six games like they did last year. Um, I will say that. I totally agree with with everything you're saying. I will say this, guys. Keep an eye out for the Washington Wizards, the Orlando Magic, the Milwaukee Bucks, um, Toronto Raptors. I think those are just to try out four names. They're not going to play all those teams. Half those teams will knock each other out. Fair enough. But I'm saying that, that if they go up against any of those teams, they are facing formidable opponents. The, if the Greek freak gets injured, there's nobody else in that team. Oh, I agree. I, I, Milwaukee's I'm, done. You take no, out no. John Wall. On that team, they're in trouble. I agree, but, but you're you're thinking about Lowry him. up in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, Lowry and and, and uh, Demar Derozan. I, I Those, that's the two headed dog. That's the, now, in my opinion, the best team in the East besides the the Cavaliers. The Celtics are gonna be hurting. Yeah, well, we saw what happened the other year when they, it was four one, four two when they played them a couple years yeah. ago. It's over. It's going to be an absolute collision course. We'll come back to this later this season. Yeah, uh, definitely. It's a pleasure. Juan, thank you so much for coming on. We'll help, hopefully have you on and some other people here, too, in the near future. For uh, sure. Guys, if you haven't checked out our social medias, Twitter, at Seat at the T, right behind us here. That's our logo here as well. Um, thanks for coming in tonight. Guys, everyone out there, be safe and go Buckeyes. Hell yeah. Have a good night, guys.